Well, good morning, Grandview family. It is good to see you all here with us. Well, let's stand on up together and let's uh, let's start our morning off with the uh, with the song of worship this morning. Sing with me with this heart open wide, with this heart open wide from the depths. From the heights, I'll bring a sacrifice with these hands lifted high. With these hands lifted high, hear my song and hear my cry. I'll bring a sacrifice. I will bring. Come on, sing it out. I lay me down. And I lay me down on that prayer. And I belong to you alone. And lay me down, lay me down. And hands on my heart, this much is true.
Amen. Well, let's lift up a praise to the Lord this morning. Amen. Well, you guys can sit for just a sec if you want to. Um, I just want to say welcome to Grandview in the Park. It is so awesome to see all you guys here. It's awesome to see um, our folks online as well. Uh, thank you guys so much for adhering to the COVID guidelines with the distancing and the mask and everything else. We can't thank you enough for for doing that, helping us out. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. Um, one other real fast thing before we get back into worship. We, there's a guy around here, most of you guys know, his name's Bruce. <laughs> he had a birthday yesterday, so let's just give a big happy birthday clap to Bruce. We're not going to tell how old he is, but he's a spring chicken, at least that's what I call him. Bruce is just our spring chicken. So, um, so for real quick for a second, does everybody just look around at all the folks that are here gathered together in this place? How awesome is it that as a body of Christ that we can come together and we can worship even with these crazy circumstances that we're dealing with? And like we, we as the body of Christ can come together and we can edify each other and we can, we can just sing our praises to the Lord. Man, is this not awesome or is this not awesome? I mean, I know our circumstances. Yeah, go ahead, clap. I know our circumstances are crazy, but man, what an awesome day to be here in the park together and just to lift up and sing praises to the Lord, because man, he is, he is awesome, amen? Well, let's, let's continue to worship this morning. Let's stand on up, and let's, uh, we're going to sing out a few more songs, and let's just, uh, let's just lift our voices, man. Let's, uh, let's, just, let's just lift up this park so these neighbors are like, man, what is going on? They have a God that's living. They have a God that's worthy of praise this morning. So let's... Let's join, let's sing out again this morning. Sing with me, I count on one thing. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me. this morning. I count on one thing. I count on one thing. Seeing God never fails when I fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. Seeing God is never lame. is working all things out. You're working Let's 
give the Lord some praise because he is the never failing. Amen. Sing us out together this morning. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Father, in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we praise you this morning, God, because you are great. God, we praise you because you are worthy of every single breath for us to turn back to a praise for you, Father. 
Father, we realize that it is by your grace, God, that we have this air to breathe. Father, because without your grace, we would be gone, Father. And we love you so much for that. God, I just pray that as Bruce comes and brings your word this morning, Father, I just pray that, that your spirit would just continue to move in this part, Father. God, that your spirit would just speak to our hearts, God, and speak to our minds in a way that only your spirit can this morning. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Mr. Amen. Bruce, you can come on up. Thanks, Devin. Appreciate you being here. Hey, guys, that was awesome worship this morning. Thank you so much for being a part of our worship in the park today. We are excited you're here. Uh, for a little while, we were just afraid it was going to be just the setup crew. But, hey, you're here now. So thanks for being here. We're looking forward to worshiping with you. What a gorgeous day. I know it's a little cooler. I know it's a little breezier. And it's a foretaste of what's to come. And so we are certainly praying for what God's got on our, uh, what's next for us in terms of as a church. What do we expect to be able to do and not do in the days to come? Uh, we're thankful that we're not the only ones that are wondering out what's going to happen. We know there's a lot of confusion out there. We know there's a lot of what about this, what about that. And if it's not related to COVID, it's related to finances and economy. If it's not related to that, it's related to the racial tensions that are out there. So we have a plenty of opportunities to just go before God and say, God, we need you. And so you're here today, and I want to be a blessing to you. I want to be an encouragement to you. I want to help you to see that together we're going to not only make it through this thing, but we're going to allow God to take something that maybe the enemy meant for evil, and we turn it to good. God turns it to good for his honor and glory. I have a sneaking suspicion that when this all is written up in the history books in the years to come, that there's going to be a lot of people who say, you know, COVID is what did this for us. COVID is what allowed this to happen. And I think that's probably going to be true with the church as well, because this is our opportunity to just step back and take a look at what's going on. Now, that's just a little hint of what we know is going to be happening in the future, which is change. That's all we know for sure. But things are going to be happening, so we're just praying that God's going to lead us and guide us every step of the way. He's the only one that knows everything that's going on. He's the only one that has a good solution, so we're really trying to listen in. So you pray with me, pray for me, and let's find out what God's going to do. So whether you're here in the park today or you're watching online, we're just thankful for you. We want you to know that COVID may come and go, but we pray that by God's grace, Grandview is going to stay here. We pray almost every Sunday, if not more often than that, that Jesus will build his church in this community. And you guys are proof of the fact that he's doing that. So thank you for being there. And for all the folks that are on vacation, we get that. Just come back refreshed. Come back ready to serve. We look forward to seeing you when you can get back. But for those of you that are here today, man, we are so thankful for each and every one of you. Now, we are in the Old Testament book of Daniel today and next Sunday. We're going to be wrapping up this book. Not that the book is finished, but at least the part of it that we're going to study. And I want you to know that even though Daniel is an old book, 2,600 years plus or minus a few hundred probably, uh, even though it's an old book, the issues that he wrestled with back in his day are the same issues you and I wrestle with today. That's the beauty of God's Word. It is so old, and yet it's so relevant. It's so applicable in our everyday lives. So here's some of the questions that I hope that we're going to answer today as we look into this incredible story. Does God have expectations of us? Does God have expectations of us? If we took a poll of the majority of Coloradans today, what would their answer be? They might say, there is no God. Ha uh ha. -huh. You know, we don't believe in God. There might be some that say, yeah, maybe he does. I'm a pretty good person. I think he's going to be okay with that. But no matter where we are, no matter what we're wrestling with, I want you to know that God does have expectations of us. We're going to see that in today's story. And not just of the king of uh, Babylon way back in the day, but he has expectations of you and me and everyone the sound of my voice. Now, if you guys know anything about baseball, I heard the Rockies started back. Way to go, Rockies. I asked about how the stands were looking, and it was cutouts, right? Is that what you guys tell me? So that's got to be freaky. You have paper cutouts cheering you on to victory, you know. These are weird days that we're living in. Let's talk about baseball for a moment. Anybody know how many strikes you get before you're out? Three. Good answer. Okay, how many strikes does God give us before we're out? Uh, and then how many outs do we have? Well, we're going to 
play with that just a little bit today and hopefully we'll get some ideas that, yes, there comes a point where God says enough is enough. And speaking of God, does he give us warnings? How does he give us warnings? Why does he give us warnings? And what happens if we don't pay attention to those warnings? Those are some of the questions that we hope to answer in this incredible story that we're going to be talking about today. So have you ever been in a situation where you saw the handwriting on the wall before it happened? Does that ever happen to anybody? Yes, no, maybe, okay. There was just something about something that said, eh, I know where this is going. Uh, this is not a great illustration. It's a very humbling one. But when I went to college, I wanted to sing in uh, the college um, groups. And so the most prestigious group uh, was where I wanted to sing because I wanted to be in the best group, right? So I went to the audition, and uh, they said, sing this song for us. Well, for one, it was a song I never heard of, never seen before. And two, I wasn't that great a sight reader. And so I could get the handwriting on the wall really quick. This is not going well, because I bet you there's some people that come in here and say, oh, yeah, I know that song. And, and it's just great. And they were in the club. So I didn't get that position, by the way. I didn't get to sing with that group. So once I saw the handwriting on the wall, I went another direction and went to another group that had a much lower standard, thankfully. And I was able to get in there, all right? But I saw the handwriting on the wall, man. As soon as they put that sheet music in front of me, I said, man, I am sunk. This is not going to happen. Thankfully, when I went to the other audition, it was a much easier song. And obviously, their hearing was messed up that day or something. And they allowed me to be a part. But it was a lot of fun. And I'm thankful that God allowed me to see the handwriting on the wall. And more importantly, that I allowed to, got to do that after all. So today's message, I'm calling it When God Tweets. And everybody knows about Twitter. Um, Twitter is pretty cool in that you have a limit to the number of words. And some of us probably are on some other forms of social media to where the words go on and on and on and on. Well, thankfully, Twitter has a limit. And this is a case where God is going to tweet in, in his appropriate time and appropriate way. And so when God tweets, what's the significance of that? Well, we're going to plug into that in just a minute. So far in Daniel, we've seen that God uses mysterious and miraculous means to accomplish his purposes. It doesn't matter who's on the throne. It doesn't matter if the people of Israel have been taken captivity or not. God is still in charge. He is still in control. God not only uses mysterious means and miraculous means, but he uses his servants, average ordinary guys. Well, sometimes extraordinary guys. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these guys are top drawer guys. They're at the top of the line, and God has put them in a unique place for a strategic purpose and time. We've been looking at not only those guys, but we've been looking at a king by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar. He's the guy that took the people of Israel out of Judah and brought them to Babylon. He's the guy that brought in some of these guys to train them and use them in his kingdom. He's the guy that God has been working with over and over, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. God has been working through King Nebuchadnezzar. But now King Nebuchadnezzar goes on, and he meets his end like we all will one day. And as a result of that, we find a new guy coming onto the scene. We'll talk about him in just a minute. But what I want you to know is that in this particular passage today, we're going to find that God gave a couple of comments and phrases that were so significant that 2,600 years later, we still refer to these phrases. Now, the first one I've already alluded to, the handwriting on the wall, right? So that's a phrase that's traced all the way back to this account. So people use that phrase probably all the time. Yeah, I see the handwriting on the wall. This is what's going to happen. It came from this passage of scripture. How cool is that? We're going to find there's another one in here as well. All that to say, this is an awesome passage of scripture. Let's begin reading in Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, and we're just going to read just a little bit of this story to get it started, and then we're going to jump into our text today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, thank you so much for being so on task, on, on the job, so much being in charge and, and, and in just in position of sovereignty in the world today. Thank you for being on your throne. Thank you for this incredible passage of Scripture, this story that has such great significant even, significance even now in our time, in our culture, with the challenges that we're facing. Thank you so much for this. I pray that your spirit who inspired this word will take this your servant and speak through me. And if necessary, in spite of me, 
because this message is so crucial. This message is so important. Father, we need to hear from you today, and I pray that by your Spirit, you'll speak to every heart in the sound of my voice. Thank you so much for the privilege that we have to be in this beautiful place on this beautiful day and to let this community and the world know that we love Jesus and he loves us. And he has a plan and a purpose for each and every person that lives on this planet. Help us to do our part to get the word out to them. We pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So we found out that God sends a tweet 2,600 years ago before Twitter was ever invented. And the first part of this message is really important to us, and it's found in verses 1 through 6. And let's read those together, shall we? King Belteshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the kings and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. And as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand lamp stand in the royal palace. The king watched as a hand as it wrote. His face turned pale. And he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Whoa, this God tweet really got this king's attention, didn't it? How cool is that? Well, let's think about this guy that God's getting his attention. Let's think about King Belshazzar. He's a new person of significance in this book. And he's going to be coming in in chapter 5 and he's going to be leaving in chapter 5. So he's not quite the guy that his grandfather was. King Belshazzar was probably the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar. His father, who was actually the king that was reigning, was actually uh, away on king's business, and so he put his son in charge of Babylon. So he's actually second in command, even though he's running the show in Babylon. Now, when the cat's away, the mice play. That's the old saying. So when dad's away and he's got the palace to himself, why not have a party, right? I know they don't do that kind of stuff now, but maybe they do. They certainly did then. And so King Belshazzar says, hey, I'm going to invite all the who's who in Babylon, and I'm going to throw a big party, and Dad hopefully won't find out or hopefully won't care, whatever. And so he has this great party going on, and he's a little bit full of himself, and he makes a big mistake. He crosses a line, and so God sends an amazing, attention-grabbing message to him. This man made a mistake. He crossed the line. And so let's see what his mistakes were. In verses 1 through 4, we read a few of them. And then later on in chapter, uh, later on in the chapter, we're going to find out that God's going to point out some other things to him. But probably the first mistake that he made is found in verse 1. And that is he drank wine with his friends. Now, drinking wine is certainly not the end of the world. But it appears to me that as I study the scripture that he drank too much wine. He drank so much wine that his maybe clouded judgment became even more clouded. And he made a mistake that he maybe wouldn't have made if he was sober. So his first mistake was is he got himself on a slippery slope. And he was having such a great time that he just kept drinking and kept drinking. And his first mistake led him to his second mistake. He's having this great time and everybody's saying, man, King Belshazzar, you're pretty awesome. You're way to go, guy. You're the best. And he says, you know, I am pretty cool. And so I think this is what we're going to do. We're going to pull out all the articles that were taken, stolen from the temple in Jerusalem and brought all the way to Babylon. We're going to bring them out and we're going to drink some wine out of them. How cool is that, right? Well, it didn't make a lot of sense to me until I started doing a little research. And I found out that he knew that uh, Darius, the Persian, was on his way marching to Babylon. And he was doing a pretty good job of taking over other kingdoms, and he was on his way to take care of Babylon as well. Now, King Belshazzar is saying, well, what can I do to possibly um, get myself in a position to where we're going to be fine, even though Darius is knocking out a lot of other people, he's not going to get us. And so maybe what he thought was, hey, our gods beat up the god in Jerusalem because we took them captive. So that means our gods are bigger than his, right? So we're going to bring out, as reminders of the fact that our gods are so powerful, we're going to bring out those goblets of gold, and we're going to have a big party just reminding, 
hey, we have nothing to fear because our gods are even bigger than Yahweh, right? So it appears that maybe he was using those goblets to just kind of remind themselves that, hey, we can handle this Darius the Persian guy because we beat up the God of uh, Yahweh, the God of Israel. And so why can't we beat these guys? Well, if that wasn't a bad enough mistake, that was number two. Number three was this. While he's drinking from God's goblets, he's praising the false gods, those false idols. He's gone from bad to worse. This is a terrible mistake on his part. He makes a third strike, and here's what is going to get him in trouble. He probably thought that as we toast our gods who seemingly had victory over the God of Israel that we're going to be safe against the Persian gods and God's saying wrong wrong so his third mistake leads to the prompt that God gives him the handwriting on the wall the tweet that God says here's what I have to say here's my warning to you now it's not until later in the text after we find out that nobody can read the writing on the wall except for Daniel The queen comes in and saves the day and says, I know nobody can read this, but there is somebody. He's kind of old and he's in the nursing home, but let's go ahead and drag him out. And I bet you he can read this. So they bring Daniel out. He's probably quite old by this time. He comes in and he says, yes, I can read it for you. All right. So when he reads this tweet, here's some other mistakes that he's going to reveal that we'll get to in just a moment. But first of all, he said, you have not humbled yourself. Now, here's a king that is following in the footsteps of his grandfather, King Nebuchadnezzar. And he hadn't humbled himself. And Scripture says in verse 22 that he knew all about King Nebuchadnezzar and all the stories that we've been learning about him. Chapter 1, how he captured Jerusalem, how Daniel stood up against him. And they ended up changing their diet for Daniel's sake because his convictions were strong. And then in chapter 2, when we had the vision, the dream, he wanted the vision Uh, told to him the dream told to him and interpreted and so God did that for him in chapter 3 we find uh, Shadrach Meshach and Abednego are not willing to bow down to the idol that he's made the big statue and so over and over Nebuchadnezzar has been told listen you're not God God is God and so Belshazzar now comes along and says oh that was then this is now that doesn't apply to me have you ever heard that phrase before oh but that doesn't apply to me I know you'd never say that right That that speed limit, that doesn't apply to me. Man, that gets me a lot. I just like, Lord, come on, seriously? Nobody's going by that thing. Why would I have to, right? So if you've ever said that doesn't apply to me, watch out. That's what King Belshazzar must have done. His fourth mistake is he hadn't humbled himself. He knew God had humbled his grandfather, but somehow or another, he thought it didn't apply to him. Later on in verse 23, Uh, Daniel's going to point out to him that he had set himself up against the God heaven. So not only had he not humbled himself, he's basically spitting in God's face saying, Ha ha, you think you're hot stuff. I'm taking all these goblets that we stole from the temple in Jerusalem, and we're going to drink and we're going to party with them, as if that's no big deal. It is a big deal. There are still some sacred things in life. Reminds me, growing up in Akron, Colorado, we were at the church that I grew up in, and we were doing something, the kids or youth, I don't remember what it was. And uh, we were doing something on the, the stage of the church building. And I remember that I, uh, there were some hymnals and uh, a Bible up front. And I can remember taking some hymnals and stacking them on top of a Bible on the floor. And one of the ladies in the church just freaked out. She said, Bruce, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know, what did I do? He said, you don't put the Bible on the floor and you don't put hymnals on top of the Bible. And I learned at an early age, there's some things that are just really important, at least to that lady it was, and I've never forgotten that. I found out the same thing is true in Brazil. I was on a mission trip down there, and one day we were eating in the church, and uh, I had my Bible because they asked me to do a little devotional, and I sat down to eat, and we're just sitting in a chair like you guys are, and I'm thinking, I got way too many stuff, so I laid my Bible on the floor. They freaked out. Don't you know how dirty our floors are, I think is what they were trying to say. Don't you know how precious this Bible is? And so they came and picked it up and put it up someplace for me. It's like, wow, that's embarrassing. 
I just made a fool of myself in front of all these people who thought I was this great preacher from the United States of America. They found out in a hurry that wasn't true. So the mistake was, is that I didn't recognize there's some things that are sacred. This king made that mistake. He had set himself up, verse 23, against the Lord of heaven. He did not honor the God who holds in his hand his life and all of his ways. Folks, I think this is the heart of his mistake right here. He knew all about the God that was very much in charge back in grandfather's days. Why would he think that God still wasn't alive and well in his day? Why didn't he honor God rather than make fun of him? Why didn't he? You see, God had to remind him, the only reason you have breath in your lungs today is because I've given them to you. The only reason that you're the king of Babylon while your dad's running around doing his thing is because I've given you this opportunity. There is nothing in your life that God hasn't given. If you got clothes on your back, it's from God. If you got money in the bank, it's from God. If you have something to drive, it's from God. If you have a roof over your head, it's from God. Everything that we have, who controls where we're born? We're not controlling that. God is. I've been in a lot of places. I've been privileged to see a lot of things. And I'm here to tell you that we are super, super blessed in the United States of America. And we are super, super blessed in Mead. And God has given us everything we have. He has our life and all of our ways in his hands. And this king reminds us that God expects us to honor him because of that. Now, the sad thing and the last mistake that he made is after Daniel comes through and knocks it out of the park and not only reads what the sign says, but he interprets it for him, instead of saying, wow, that sounds pretty scary, I better get my ducks in the row, he says, oh, cool, I'm going to promote you, I'm going to give you this robe, give you the gold chain, you're going to be the third highest in, in the kingdom. And Daniel's saying, dude, you're not getting this. Because the scripture is going to tell us that he dies that very night. God gave him the warning that day, and that night he dies. Whoa. He made a mistake thinking, oh, I've got time to think about that. I've got time to decide whether or not I really want to take this God thing seriously or not. This was his final and fatal mistake. So we've looked at the man. We've looked at the mistakes that he made. Let's listen to the message that God gives him. It starts out with those four simple words, but it's much more significant than that. And Daniel's going to help us to see that. So we're going to begin reading at verse 18. Daniel's come on the scene. He is now the guy that, as everybody's listening to, okay, what's Daniel got to say? What's, what's he think all about all this? So let's read what he says. Verse 18, Your majesty, the most high God, gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position that he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those a king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. Those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was disposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from the people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like, like the ox, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven. Until, until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets them over anyone he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. Instead, you set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot hear or understand or see, but you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life, and all your ways. Therefore, this God, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is what the inscription that was written was. Meany, meany, tekel, parson. And here's what these words mean. Meany, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. Wow! What is the message 
that God gives this king that's really appropriate in our day and time as well. First of all is this. God not only exists, he speaks. Remember the question I started about, does God have expectations of us? Yes, God exists, and yes, he speaks. And that's how we know what his expectations are. He's given us his message, and he expects us to read that message and to apply it to our everyday lives. Now, the best way that God speaks is what we call special or specific revelation. And this book right here is our best example of that. For thousands of years, this book has been our record of how God speaks. This is who God is. This is how he works. This is what he expects of us. And so God has given us his word because he speaks. He's also given us his son. His son is a perfect example of everything that's written in this book. Everything that you're supposed to do and the things that you're not supposed to, those are perfectly lived out in the life of Jesus. The Word of God and the Son of God are special, specific revelation from God because God has something to say. But He not only gave us that, He gave us His creation. You can look to the west and you can see those incredible Rocky Mountains and you can say, wow, I wonder how those things got there. You can hike on them, you can jeep in them, you can drive up in them, and you can say, wow, this is incredible. Why? Because God is saying, hey, I'm out here. Pay attention. I've got something to say. Listen to me. Creation says I'm here. Creation says I'm powerful. Creation says that I'm really smart, otherwise this wouldn't exist. But he does more than that. He gives us a specific revelation. And in this case, the revelation that he had given to King Belshazzar is the way I dealt with your grandfather is the way I deal with everybody. And you haven't been paying attention. The message is God is a speaking God. He's not only speaking in his word and his son in creation, but he's creative in the way he speaks. In Daniel, we found out he speaks in dreams. In fact, God uses dreams a lot in the Bible. I've heard stories, particularly in overseas countries, where God is really speaking through people through dreams. So I'm not saying that he will or won't, but I'm saying be careful. He might. He speaks in dreams. He speaks in tweets. Go figure. Four words is all it needed for God to get his message across. He speaks through a person, your neighbor, a friend, a family member, a co-worker, a boss, the preacher of all things. He can speak through people. He can speak through an experience, a close call that you might have. He might speak through a heartbreaking situation that you're facing, a family issue, a work issue. God has his way of writing on the walls of our lives. He is a creative God. He's a creative speaker. But keep in mind that he speaks. But not only does he speak, but secondly, he watches. He's listening. He understands what's going on, not only in what he sees happening, but he understands our hearts. He watches and he listens. And it's interesting that the hand doesn't randomly show up. When does the hand show up to write on the wall? Not until his third strike. When they do that praising those false gods using God's implements from the temple, God said, that's it. You're out. God said that was enough. He's watching and he's listening. He's not going to act necessarily a week later, not necessarily a month later. We know that he spoke on this day. The king hears his word on this day, and the Lord acts on this day. That's pretty quick. So we need to recognize that God is not only speaking, but he's watching. He's paying attention to my life and yours. And he wants to make sure that we're hearing what he has to say. Because God does have expectations, thirdly. He speaks, he watches, and he expects. He expects. He expects us to learn, to learn from others. Remember I say it often, to know is to owe. If you know something, just like Belshazzar knew about how God had dealt with his uh, grandfather, then God expects you to act on that. Not just to know it in your head, but to live it out in your life. And if you're not doing that, then you're missing out the whole reason why God speaks in the first place. He has an expectation for us to learn from the mistakes of others. Otherwise, as history says, either you learn from history or you're condemned to live it out again. So we need to listen. We need to pay attention to what God has, his expectations. And in this particular case, I want you to know not everybody got handwriting on the wall. The reason that King Belshazzar did, because God had put him in a key position of leadership. And when you're in leadership, if you're in leadership, 
then your level of accountability to God is much higher, which makes me stay awake at night sometimes. Recognizing that as the leader of this group of people, as this part of the body of Christ, it's my responsibility to listen more carefully than anybody else in this church family. Because God has given me that responsibility. And us, if you're in a position of leadership at work, in your home, wherever it is, I want you to know that not only to know is to owe, but to lead is to owe. And this guy had a lot of responsibility. He had a lot of opportunity to honor God like his grandfather did on multiple occasions, but he never did that. God expects us to learn from others. And he expects us to honor him because he's the one who holds our life in his hands. You and I are here today because God in heaven decided to give us life and breath. And the day that he says, your day is up, your life is gone. I want you to know that until then, God has an expectation of you. And that's to honor him. This is what we want to get the message out to people in Mead and beyond. That God has expectation of you. He's an incredibly good God. He says a lot of cool things through creation. He says a lot of amazing things through His Son and the Word of God. But He has expectations of you. And we need to not only know that ourselves, but we need to get the Word out that He's in control. We don't have kings today. We live in a democracy. But the fact of the matter is you and I are kings of our own lives. We want to be in charge. We want to do what we want to do when we want to do it. And King Belshazzar is a reminder to me and you that if we put ourselves in charge of our lives, then God has a great expectation of us. We need to be careful of that. We need to be mindful of that. God not only speaks, He not only watches, He not only expects, but God weighs. Thankfully, not the scale I'm hiding in my closet. I drag it out every once in a while just to see how bad it really is. But I'm not talking about that kind of scale. I'm talking about kind of scale that they used back in the day that this was written. And that particular kind of scale was the balance scale. You had a certain weight on this side, and then you would put your produce on the other side. And God said, here's the expectations I have for you, King Belshazzar. And I look at your life, and I found that you've been found wanting. The balance was is that God had higher expectations for him than he was living. God expected him to honor him. He did not do that. I want you to know that God has a balance. And though we're saved by grace through faith, there's no other way to be right with God. That when we come into that right relationship with God, we have to understand that God has reasonable expectations of us. Reasonable expectations of us. God often reminds me, of Romans chapter 12 that says, in view of God's incredible mercies, I urge you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, which is your reasonable and appropriate act of worship. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing your mind. And why is that important? So that you can test, approve, and obey God's will, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is what we do in view of God's incredible mercies towards us as we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. God weighs. He weighed King Belshazzar and he said, you're not living up. You're not living up to the expectation that I have for you. My fear today is that we may be more like Belshazzar than we think we are. And because of that, God is writing on the wall. He's given us this story. He's given us this scripture to say, what's God writing on the wall of your life? What does he want us to know? Well, for sure, he wants us to know that he's listening and he's watching and he's weighing what you and I are doing or not doing. And he may be giving us a message. He may be giving us an opportunity to say, whoops, I'm kind of off the path here. I need to get back on. Kind of reminds me what happens when we're out farming, got to do a little bit of wheat harvest. And I was driving the combine and we've got this really nice thing that's called auto steer. It's kind of like an autopilot or kind of like a cruise control. You just push this button and the combine drives itself, which is pretty dang cool. I mean, a perfectly straight line, which is even cooler yet. But guess what? If you start messing with it, it starts going and it's saying, dude, you're messing up. Let go of this thing, and let's get this thing back on track. And I want you to know that God might be beeping right now for you. And he says, you're not on track. You are not paying attention. Get back on track. Let me be in charge of your life. I believe that God is sending us a tweet today. 
I hope you've read it. I hope you've interpreted it properly. And I hope by God's grace that when we meet again, you can say, man, I did what God told me to do. And your story will end so much better than King Belshazzar's did. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this incredible story that happened so long ago and yet still has great power in our day and time. I thank you, Father, that you are a gracious God, that you not only give us three strikes, you often give us a dozen strikes, and you might give us 30 strikes, but eventually there comes a time where you say, this is how far I'm going to let you go and no farther. And that's a scary thought, and by your grace, Father, I pray that each one of us will listen to that writing on the wall in each of our hearts and lives. And whatever it is you're telling us to do, I pray that by your grace we'll step out and do it, whether it's to come to faith in Jesus, whether it's to follow him in believer's baptism, whether it's to be a part of this church family, whether it is to start practicing the discipline of spiritual stewardship, whatever it might be, Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that whatever you're speaking to our hearts about, help us to be obedient, whatever the cost, because in the end, the cost is so small compared to the cost of disobedience. So Father, thank you so much for this opportunity we've had to look into your word We pray now that as we continue to worship, that your spirit will stir us. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, let's have one more song of of worship together, and then we're going to close things up just real briefly. But let's stand and worship together as Devin leads us. Again, sing with me with this heart open wide. And with this heart open wide from the depths, from the heights, I'll bring a sacrifice with these hands lifted up and with these hands lifted high. Hear my song and hear my cry. I will bring a sacrifice. I will bring. I will bring a sacrifice. Cause I lay me down on that Lift up a clap of praise this morning. On again. Hey.
Thanks so much for being here today. What a blessing it's been. I want to just mention a couple of things before we go our separate ways. And for those of you online, you might want to know this as well. Uh, we've got some exciting things going on. Believe it or not, COVID has not stopped God from working. I uh, just found out this week that we've got another person that wants to be baptized. And so we've got at least a half a dozen people that says we want to follow Jesus and believers baptism. So we knew that we had some of those folks that actually were going to get baptized way back when COVID first started. And of course, we've been saying, let's wait, let's wait. But we're probably waiting long enough. So as people are getting back from their sp summer get togethers and getaways and all that kind of stuff, we think it's time to go ahead and have our baptism. So right now, the tentative plan is in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have a baptism tank somewhere in the park and we're going to have a baptism. Woo! -hoo! How's that for awesome? Okay, this is really exciting. So if you have not followed Jesus in believer's baptism, I'm giving you some time to think and pray about that because this might be a great opportunity. How cool would it be to be doing a public decoration of your faith in Jesus right here in the Meadtown Park? How awesome is that? All right. Also along those lines, it's been a long time since we've done the, done the Lord's Supper together. Uh, right around Easter, we did the last time. And it's kind of tricky with COVID, but we've ordered some really special uh, communion cups that have built-in wafers and everything. So as you check in, it'll either be this week, this coming week or the following week, we're going to do the Lord's Supper together. You'll check in like you've been doing. And if you didn't check in, by the way, please do on the way out. That way we can show that we've done our homework with everybody. Um, we'll just give you a communion cup per person, and then we'll have communion together. So it'll really be an awesome experience here in the park. How cool is that? Yet still COVID guidelines. How cool is that? So, uh, And you won't even have to wear your mask while you're taking the Lord's Supper. How's that for awesome? Okay. That was a joke. Sorry, I can't see your face. Don't know if you got that. So that's coming up. That's pretty awesome. We're excited about that. We're also excited about the student kickoff for uh, the fall. And uh, we're thankful that Devin and Diane are going to be starting out with our students this year. They're doing their fall semester kickoff on Saturday the 15th, which is just two weeks from yesterday. It's going to be 7 p.m. to 945 uh, it's going to be at the Klatz house. Lots of room there. Lots of fun things they can do. Uh, we want you to get the word out to all of your students, sixth grade through high school. Please come out on the 15th of August. It's going to be really awesome. You'll have a great time. Give you a chance to see what God's doing in and through Diana and all the other awesome workers that we have working with them. And then just in closing, uh, I know a lot of folks are wondering what are we going to do. It's a little cool today. Personally, I think it feels great. Uh, if you're a little too cool, just come a little earlier and help us set up and you'll be fine. I know that from experience, okay? Now, seriously, we know that the day is coming when we're not going to be able to do this. So we are looking around because I did get word that at least through September, we're still not going to be allowed into the school. So we knew that it was going to be probably sometime in September at the earliest. We found out it won't be even the end of September, but maybe the 1st of October, we don't know. But just in case COVID allows us and the school doesn't allow us to work together, we're looking at other options. I pretty much come to the conclusion, and Devin can verify, there are no good options. That's why we've been in the school. But you pray with us. If God wants us to have a space beside the school, then just pray that God will make that clear. He's opened so many doors in the past. We're praying he's going to do that. We're knocking, and the doors that open will say praise God for that. But... So far, nothing is open, okay? So just know that God's got this. I'm not worried about it. If and when we can't go to the school, if and when we need a place to be, we are definitely going to trust God to do that. In the meantime, there's no reason that we can't move ahead with online only. We did it before. We survived. Look at you guys. You're proof of the fact we survived online only, all right? So if we have to go back that, we're going to do that. We're also going to be talking about small group options, how we can help people find and follow Jesus through COVID-19, whatever restrictions we have. So we've got a lot to be thankful for. We also have a lot to be praying about. I'm thankful you're here. Let's look around our neighbors. Let's look around our church family and say, who's not here today? Let's reach out to them, love on them really good. You guys have an incredible rest of the Lord's Day. Look forward to seeing you soon. You're dismissed.